Our second reading of scripture comes from the Old Testament prophet Zephaniah. Zephaniah is one of the minor prophets. We call Zephaniah and Haggai and Micah and a few others, we call them minor prophets, not because they're unimportant, but because their books, their prophecies, are short. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, they just drone on and on and on for 30 plus chapters. And so they're called major prophets, not because they're more important, but because they just had a lot of paper and ink. <laughs> Zephaniah was prophesying somewhere about the same time as Isaiah. Some scholars might even say that Zephaniah may have been a student of Isaiah. We remember that when the Babylonians came in and they exiled the Jerusalemites to Babylon, they kicked out a lot of people. They kicked out all of the high and mighty people, all of the one percenters. They, they kicked out everybody that they thought might get in their way. And they left a few um, bureaucrats behind, a, a few preachers that they didn't think would do very much harm when the Babylonians were there in Jerusalem. And one of those was Isaiah. And some think that Zephaniah might have been one of the others. So Isaiah, or what we have as the book of Isaiah, is actually in three parts. There's the first part of Isaiah, then there's the middle part, then there's the very end part. Zephaniah was the student of the first Isaiah. Babylonia, Babylon is still in Jerusalem. The exile is still fresh in everyone's mind. There's no end of the exile in sight. That comes at the end of Isaiah. That comes with other prophets. So here's Zephaniah. And we're at the end of Zephaniah. It's the third of three chapters. Zephaniah has this pattern. Do any of you know people who have patterns of behavior? They, they do this, then they do that. Then they do this, then they do that. They're never going to do that unless they do this first. This is what Zephaniah's pattern is. Nine times he has hollered to the people about why they have put themselves into this mess. Nine times he has said, woe be unto you. And nine times he says, on the other hand. This is the ninth and final time of Zephaniah saying, on the other hand. Sing aloud, O daughter Zion. Shout, all Israel. Rejoice and exult with all your heart, O daughter Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away the judgments against you. The Lord has turned away your enemies. The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. You shall fear disaster no more. On that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Do not fear, O Zion. Do not let your hands grow weak. The Lord your God is in your midst, a warrior who gives victory. The Lord will rejoice over you with gladness. The Lord will renew you in love. The Lord will exult over you with loud singing as on a day of festival. And now the Lord speaks directly to the people. I will remove disaster from you so that you will not bear reproach for it. I will deal with all your oppressors at that time, says the Lord. And I will save the lame and gather the outcast and I will change their shame into praise and renown in all the earth. At that time I will bring you home at the time when I gather you. For I will make you renowned and praised among all the peoples of the earth when I restore your fortunes before your eyes, says the Lord. Here ends our reading of scripture for this day. 
May God's Spirit open our hearts and our minds that we would understand God's truth and live God's reality. Amen. So we've already asked how many of you might be going to the Star Wars movie. Let me ask a different question. How many of you have ever heard of TED Talks? TED, T-E-D. Wow. Wow. Uh, keep your hands up. Keep your hands up. Now look around and see how many hands there are. That's just amazing. For those of you who don't know, and maybe even those who do watch TED Talks, TED, T-E-D, stands for Technology, Entertainment, and Design. They have thousands of people who have made presentations in their fields of work. Presentations about breakthroughs, presentations about insights, about all sorts of topics. If you can think of a topic, there's probably a TED talk about it. Education, technology. If you want to know anything about what's happening in the internet, or all you have to do is put in your search engine, TED, TED Talks. And your screen will be filled with a plethora of stuff. You, you won't have enough time in the rest of your lives to, to even watch half of the TED Talks. Every so often, at least for me, somebody will post a link to a social network site. You know, it's kind of that generic, oh, you ought to go watch this. This is really interesting. It was interesting to me, so I'm going to put a link on my Twitter, Instagram, Facebooky thing, and, and you, you should go and watch it. So every once in a while, I mean every rarely once in a while, I'll go and I'll watch a TED Talk. See, the thing is, most of them are like 20, 25 minutes long. And, and sometimes you get into the four, six minute mark and they still have your interest. But a lot of times at, at the 11 minute mark, I'm like, uh, whatever, I don't care. But one, one I clicked on because right at the bottom, I could tell, it was about seven minutes long. Seven minutes. That's like a cup of coffee. Sat down with a cup of coffee. And, and this was a TED Talk about how to change the world. How to save the world. Well, that's right up my alley. I mean, what, what do you think I'm doing here in the pulpit, right? I mean, <laughs> I need all the sermonic help I can get. And I'm already four minutes into this and haven't even told you what the TED Talk's about. <laughs> how we wash our hands, even more specifically, how we dry our hands could change the world. <laughs> I could tell. Some of you are like, oh, well, come on, hurry up, get to John the Baptizer. <laughs> when you wash your hands, wash your hands mentally, right? Okay, you got it? Now, you're done, shake your hands 12 times, everybody, shake your hands. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Take a paper towel, fold it in half, dry your hands. Shake twelve times, fold a towel in half, dry your hands. I could tell some of you are like, one, there's no such TED talk. Two, some of you are just, you're probably pulling your phones out right now thinking, I'm going to, we got Wi-Fi access here. I'm looking at TED Talks. I don't, I don't care what the preacher talks about in the next 10 minutes. I'm going to watch this. <laughs> Shake your hands 12 times, fold a towel in half, dry your hands. Only the biggest hands that have been wetted beyond their wrists might need two paper towels. Now, I don't know about you, but Sometimes, when I'm in public facilities, the men's room, guys come in, five towels, just like automatic, one, two, three, four, five. Throw it in, boom, boom, boom. I'm like, what the world is going on here? One paper towel. Oh, and why does this TED Talk take seven minutes? Because over and over again, the gentleman who's doing this shows you how to wash your hands. I mean, get your hands good and wet. Soap them up if you want to. 
One paper towel. Here's the trick. Interstitial drying. Oh, now that's a word for you. What does that mean? When you take the paper towel and you dry between your fingers, interstitial drying, your brain tells you your fingers are dry. <laughs> Who wouldn't want to do that? I could tell. Some of you, you're, you're just not... I got, a, I got paper towels here. <laughs> now really, from paper towels to John the Baptizer is a bit of a leap. John wasn't using paper towels. He didn't care how much water he had because he had the Jordan River going by him. Unlike Bob and the public works, John didn't have to worry about saving water underground for the dry season to come. This is one of the things that Bob does a lot, and he's very good at it. I, I should pause here. Bob usually tells me after these moments, I'm never going to sit in the front row again. <laughs> John didn't have to worry about conserving water. John didn't have to worry about drying people off because they came to him, they listened, they were baptized, and then they moved on with their lives. Sometimes I think that those Jerusalemites who went out to the Jordan River were like a lot of the rest of us. They kept coming back, listening to John, hearing him preach, hearing him holler, and they probably told themselves, like us, that John wasn't preaching about them. He was preaching about someone else. John is preaching about my boss. John is preaching about my good-for-nothing son-in-law. John is preaching about those troublemakers on the other side of town. John is preaching about that congregation who has a lady pastor, as if Moses would ever let Miriam do such a thing. We just presume that we're here to listen to John zing other people. We're out here watching this show, this locust-eating preacher, telling other people why they should turn their lives around. And John goes on and on and on about repentance. You know, what amazes me is that every time we open up the Gospels and we read John, we hear the same sermon. But I would guess, as someone who does sermons, that John had more than one sermon. Because really, if I preach this same sermon next week and the week after that and the week after that, how many of you would come back five weeks from now knowing that I'm going to start out with TED Talks about drying hands? You'd probably find something else to do, right? I think John had some other sermons. But he had one good topic, repentance and preparation. I mean, there's got to be a reason to repent. And John points beyond himself. John is preaching about repentance because John wants us to understand salvation. Salvation that is coming in the form of this long-awaited Messiah. If you've been around for any length of time, you've heard us talk about the Messiah. The Messiah is going to do all sorts of things. The Messiah is going to end the Babylonian exile. The Messiah is going to bring us to the promised land. The Messiah is going to do the Messiah is going to get us out from under the thumb of Rome. In order to understand salvation that is coming in the form of the Messiah, we need to understand repentance. Now, some of us might say, well, we get re repentance on a weekly basis. I mean, look right in the bulletin. There's that unison prayer of confession, and then there's that little parenthetical, a time for silent personal confession. Well, if that's not about repentance, what is? But that's not what John is talking about. When John says repent, he's not talking about run-of-the-mill confession. He's not talking about little bitty do-overs. John is talking about something in which our life is not the same as it was just a day ago. John is talking about turning our lives around 180 degrees. 
Have you seen those shows about people who want to downsize, who want to, who want to downsize their lives into a tiny house? Tiny house living. Tiny house nation. Tiny house international. Couples and families who go from living in 2,500 square feet, three bedrooms, two and a half baths, two car garage, and a, and a six range burner on their stove to like 275 square feet. A composting toilet and you've got to climb a ladder to get into your bedroom. And bring your dogs. These people have to rethink everything about how they live and how they live with each other. John is preaching not about our space, but how we live with each other. How we have a relationship, how we have a connection with God that defines us more deeply than our names, defines us more deeply than our biology or our, our, our jobs. John says, don't be going around saying, my grandparents built this church. Don't be going around saying, I'm a fifth generation Presbyterian or, or, or my daddy was the Sunday school superintendent for 27 years. Don't be saying these things as some sort of an excuse for being uncharitable or unmerciful or just plain petty and spiteful. Having a fine family is wonderful, but it sure is not going to get you a pat on the back from the baptizer. One of the favorite things I get to say in my role as a pastor. See what love God has for us, that we should be called children of God, and truly we are. I love it when I get to say those words, holding a small child, walking with someone down the aisle after the sacrament of baptism, reminding us, reminding me, of the promises that have been made on our behalf and the promises we make on behalf of other people. Once the Jordan River evaporated from all of their clothes, once the baptismal gowns are put away in acid-free tissue for the next generation, how do we baptized people appear to everyone else? How does our baptism show up? How do those promises that we make and were made on our behalf? Some of us are lucky enough to have those polo shirts with little logos that say First Presbyterian Church Pendleton. We have a little hat with a cross on it. We have bumper stickers on our, on our vehicles. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about walking down the aisle in the grocery store, getting your coffee from a barista, hanging out at the athletic club. How does anybody know, outside the walls of this sanctuary, that we have been baptized? Have you ever met somebody new, and you ask them, so what do you do for a living? It's one of my favorite questions. And sometimes people ask me, you know, you sit on an airplane, oh, so what do you do for a living? (laughs) Every once in a while when I really, really, really want to turn off the conversation, I tell them that I'm a Presbyterian minister of word and sacrament and I'm here to save souls. (laughs) But lots of times what I say is, even, even when people see me, out on the sidewalk, shoveling snow, just right out, you know, a few feet from here. So do you work here? Yeah, I work here. <laughs> I ask people, so, so, Norm, what do you do? So, Bob, what do you, Chuck, what do you do? And people say, oh, I'm retired. Retired from what? But have you ever asked somebody, instead of, what do you do for a living? Emily, what do you do for a living? 
Instead of asking, Emily, what do you do for a living? Ask, Emily, so do you have a church home? Huh. It's a whole different question, isn't it? Because most of us have jobs, and we're more than happy to talk about ourselves, right? We have our jobs, we have our careers from which we've retired, we have our things that we've done. Ask about my kids, ask about my grandkids, ask, I'll pull out pictures. I don't have any pictures of the church, my church home. But sometimes, sometimes, once we've broken the ice, maybe ask, do you have a church home? I'm looking up in the balcony, because some of them are like, just like the rest of you. Really? Do you have a church home? We read all these prophets, Jeremiah and Malachi and Isaiah, and, and, and they, they, they point to these days to come. They point to these days to come, and they say, we need to get ready. We need to be ready for the coming of the Lord. And they usually do it with a, with a lot of just, like, energy. A, a lot of gravel in their throat, you could say. Zephaniah does the same thing. But Zephaniah also says, it's going to be so wonderful. It's going to be so filled with joy. This is why we do this. We don't do this because we're a bunch of angry Christians. We don't do this because... We want to make sure that everybody else has what we have. We do this because we already know this experience of joy. We already know this, so we may as well start being joyful right now. I keep coming back to this question. Can anybody tell, by observing our lives, can anybody tell that we bear the mark of Christ? that we're living as his faithful and joyful disciples. The Bible is filled with all sorts of responses. Micah says, what does the Lord require of you? We know the answer. To do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God. Deuteronomy and Luke picks it up later. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength, and love your neighbors as yourselves. Paul says it this way, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is commendable, keep on doing these things. Things that you've learned and received and have heard about. And if nothing else, there's just one little song. They'll know we are Christians by our love. Amen. <laughs>